What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Super pumped for this 600th episode. We will be talking about timeless spiritual wisdom. We have Dustin DePerna joining us on the show. Hi, Dustin. Alan. Hi. Thanks for coming on the program. <laughs> such a joy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's such a joy for you to join us. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful that we were able to meet thanks to the meditation retreat that was with Dan Brown yep. and that Michael McCullough was an initiator of bringing me into that. Mm -hmm. And I'm so uh, grateful that, that those teachings are, uh, that we'll be talking about them throughout this conversation and that you yourself have become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so pumped. For those that don't know Dustin's background, he is a visionary leader, author, meditation teacher, founder of Bright Alliance, and recognized expert in world religions who has committed his life to making timeless spiritual wisdom relevant and accessible for a rapidly changing global society. You can find his main link in the bio below, DustinDiperna.com, and also his Amazon profile with all of his books. Highly recommend checking those out. Dustin, let's start things off with we have been so fascinated with understanding the nature of this reality hmm. what do you think is the nature of the reality great good question <laughs> uh, let me start by saying congratulations 600 episodes is a huge feat that takes a lot yeah. of will and courage and capacity so congratulations really thank amazing you. 600 thank you. nature of reality what do you think What's nature of reality? I certainly have some answers. <laughs> yes. I'd love to say something about it. What do you think? What's nature of reality? We were mentioning this a little bit before mm -hmm. we started these like four words, a uh, holographic fractal learning simulation. Mm -hmm. and so it's just a funny like way of, <laughs> I think, describing it. Yeah. Well, you know, we all have different experiences of reality. We enact reality moment by moment according to the particular views and perspectives that we take. Those perspectives are influenced by the culture that we inherit. They're influenced by our developmental level. They're influenced by the spiritual orientation we take to life. So we all have quite different views about the nature of reality. But from my own practice and from the many amazing teachers that I've learned from, uh, things tend to point towards a reality uh, that is unbounded, meaning that there's no separation and no limits to that reality, a reality that's ultimately deeply whole, meaning that we're not in a world where um, separation, division, and suffering is something that's inevitable, but there's protect perspectives that we can take where that limitless, unbounded wholeness is one that becomes not only a temporary state that we experience, but one that can be permanently established as part of our true nature. So those are the teachings I'm really interested in. Hopefully we can talk more about it today. A timeless, unbounded wholeness, making that the norm right on a moment to moment basis exactly so you know basically one of the things that i've found so incredible is that you know many of us have had these peak experiences throughout our lives one of my dear friends and mentors ken wilbur uh, often says part of the task of spiritual practice is taking these temporary states and developing permanent traits <laughs> and uh, if we can over time train our mind and train the perspectives that we take in such a way that unbounded wholeness becomes the way that we experience day-to-day -day living, then it's more uh, we become a master of our moment-to-moment -moment experience rather than just an athlete who has temporary flow states or peaks peak experiences. Um, so for me, the stabilization of those types of recognition is what the game is all about, not just moment-to-moment -moment, uh, experiences. Oh man, the game being so about the stabilization of these types of states of awareness, I think is such a crucial um, part. And we have all of these different options for feeling uh, timeless, unbounded wholeness, mm -hmm. all of these different options. Mm -hmm. And we get to pick which ones we want to play with and experience. Mm -hmm these different options on a buffet for this recommuning with this one. And for certain ones of us, we'll like certain options on the buffet more than others. Mm. And so it's like we all have different 
uh, combinatorics of the options mm. for what feels best for us to try to get to a moment to moment state mm. of that timeless unbounded wholeness mm. but there's dangers along the path there's dangers my um my you know i have two main mentors ken wilbur and dan brown i'm sure we'll talk about it at certain points but um i remember being in a retreat with dan brown and he was teaching with a tibetan uh teacher named rahab toku rinpoche and on the retreat uh, Rahab compared today's spiritual sort of buffet, to use your sort of your language, yeah. as sort of this uh, spiritual flea market. And one of the troubles with the spiritual flea market, one of the dangers, is that you go around and you sample everything, but you don't actually take anything deep. And um, it's been my experience that there's a lot of samplers and a lot of people who are uh, picking sort of what feels good in the moment and what tastes good in the moment, but there are very few people who are willing to make the sacrifice to take something all the way to its full culmination and completion. So in my perspective, I really agree with the Zen's thing, that's that if you chase two rabbits, you don't catch any, you don't catch either. And mm. so the idea that you have to sort of pick something and go really deep into it, of course, along the way, you can supplement and complement with different paths and perspectives, but it's really important that you drill the well all the way to water. Wow. I love that. Chase two rabbits, you don't catch any, and also drill the well deep enough. We've got to be careful using water. too many metaphors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And what I find today, you know, I, I um, have a lot of exposure, particularly here in Silicon Valley and in sort of the larger Bay Area. And I find that um, a lot of people are really genuine about their spiritual seeking and their spiritual path. Sometimes what happens is that people, uh, when things start to get difficult, or if they feel let down by a particular teacher or there, there's things that happen that they sort of give up and they pick something else that feels good in the moment. Um, certainly I see this with people who are state chasing around entheogens and other things is that they uh, have a lot of really positive experiences, but there hasn't been a way in which they've made that part of their, their everyday life. And um, certainly there are people working with us who have done that, but there's a lot of people who haven't. Wow. So it's, equally as important for when we are find ourselves adventuring into consciousness in this world to um i to both identify timeless spiritual wisdom and also make it the most common baseline of our mm. moment to moment experience yeah. there's a, a very simple model that's been really influential in my life and that's a model that looks at spiritual intelligence um, Paul Tillich, as a, a theologian uh, a number of years ago, a couple, few decades ago, he defined uh, spirituality as that which is of ultimate concern. And, uh, <laughs> and his work developed in such a way where, where um, another theorist named James Fowler took his work and started to say, are there actually stages of faith development or stages of spiritual development that develop over time? And to your point, what we find is that spirituality and spiritual realization, if we want to talk about something about that's deeply experiential, has to be the underpinning or the fabric that we orient our whole life around. Um, I used to say the escape velocity of the ego is that you have to give everything to it. So you have to actually want spirituality, you have to want realization more than anything else, or else we're taking refuge in rainbows, as I say, which we can talk about. Mm. Wow. <clears throat> the ultimate uh, focus of our adventure into consciousness is spirituality and mm -hmm. making that a norm in our social fabric where it's fun and it's playful and it's on And it's happening, your flea market analogy, you know, I'm just, yeah. just to say that I was going to say it's happening on the street corners, just like our fast food is happening on the street corners. But like you said, not chasing 7,000 rabbits, but maybe, you know, there is, but there's spiritual pluralism is extremely mm -hmm. important, but also finding what works. So after sampling, finding what's working mm -hmm. and then kind of drilling down for water 
exactly so, right yeah. so so again mixing metaphors but um i think it'd be helpful if i said a little bit about the stages of spiritual development that james fowler unpacked and other people um because it, it, it points to yes. exactly what you're talking about so when we begin our spiritual journey we tend to uh, inherit the beliefs that we've been given from culture family etc and that's where most people are they've just inherited beliefs and they haven't really reflected on them they haven't changed them or adjust them they just are doing what they inherited um, as people begin to mature they move out of a just inherited form of spirituality to one that's actually self-reflexive meaning they take a moment and they pause and they think about it and they say well is this really what i believe or is this just what i inherited usually during that phrase that phase um, one of two things happens either one people reject the spirituality altogether that they've inherited because they rebel against it now that they realize they've inherited something they didn't do consciously um, or they just take a bit more critical view of it but still potentially embrace it um, or i guess there's a third option people begin to explore other options so as you move into that third level where you start to explore other options it's what you describe where spirituality becomes pluralistic where you start to see well there's something similar in this tradition and similar in this tradition you begin to look across multiple different traditions seeing similarities yeah. and i think that's awesome super yeah. helpful super yeah. good yeah. And at the same time, there are fundamental differences across different traditions and faiths. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the case that all paths actually lead to the same end or the same result. That's something that many people say from a less informed perspective because it sounds really nice. And the pluralistic orientation is mm -hmm. that all paths do lead to the same place. Mm -hmm. But paths actually are quite different and actually lead to different types of realizations. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, that's a bad thing. Because what we found through research, and my mentor Dan Brown at Harvard was one of the pioneers of this, is that even if the, the results of the past tend to be a little bit different based on the biasing perspectives of the traditions, there is some deep structure to a spiritual path that actually is similar across traditions. Mm -hmm. So then we need to make a distinction between the deep structure of spiritual awakening and the surface features, how it actually presents and the realizations that unfold. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Because as we wow. look at that pluralistic view, what then starts to happen is that we say, oh, there are enough similarities where I can take a path extremely deep and I can supplement and complement with the different aspects of the tradition that aren't supported as strongly within my tradition. So we're not just looking at a buffet, but we're looking at a path where we can go really deep in one and supplement. And I think that actually oh. is an extremely helpful orientation. Wow. Because it's not saying that we have to be exclusive, we can actually be, be quite inclusive of other paths. But it's to say that I'm willing to commit and go all the way in one path and supplement it across different paths and different traditions. So I find that really useful. That's um, James Fowler's work, and I've written many you know, books that incorporate those particular worldviews. Okay. So, as we endeavor into consciousness, we have initially these stages of development where culture, our family, act as primary forces on uh, what we think spiritually then there's a reflective process where we think of maybe happening later in our lives for me this is a very like 20s thing that happens yeah, and actually we start to gain that capacity between 9 and 12 that capacity for that type of cool. reflective thinking so yeah. some people reflecting on their own experience listening to this may find that like even in their early teens they started to reject the inherited spiritual systems that they received so yeah for other people it's older but we can happen yes. happen at many different times in life because it's important to remember alan we have different lines of development meaning that we have a spiritual line of development we have moral lines of development cognitive lines of development these things all can develop independently and so some wow. people's spiritual development might not be as evolved as their cognitive development mm -hmm. or might not be as evolved as their moral development or their ego development so we have to make sure we're looking at this in a sort of a broad and more sophisticated way some people might do that in their 20s other people are earlier some people in their 60s yeah. yeah this is mm -hmm. probably very commonly Ex felt and experienced in our society with how we talk about uh, something like a, someone of really high IQ and someone of really high uh, like social emotional intelligence mm -hmm. EQ and so that's a very common way of like now starting to see uh, mm -hmm. our world and so we talk a lot about being able to like mix like uh like poly polymathy with uh with e with empathy or eq and when mm -hmm. you can like really mix those two together you can achieve great things um but you know iq can also be very deep depth in a specific field but just 
now when you say that uh, many of us now have an opportunity to kind of reflect and be like well where am i on a on my spiritual path versus my cognitive path versus my emotional path my you know physical path there's well you know all these different well-being social path there's all these different like well-beings or paths that can then we can see what stages of development we're at in them and to continue on that last point just a little bit more when you have the the influences of uh, the early stages of development when you start reflecting and seeing you know nine to twelve the teens the the 20s when you have this time to like be, like you said you may you may find something that is getting you into uh, the the drop merging with the ocean your your recommunion with the one and as you do that process there is something that's getting you down in the well most finding water and complementing other paths along the way to continue and i think you point to something really important here which is that w when people say all paths lead to the same place that there may be similar properties of the paths that are maybe around transcendence um or uh, around some sort of a of a communion with something that is transcendent, uh, but you also said that they don't point to the mm. same uh, place, and so mm. there are different places that mm. point towards. Yeah, should yeah. I give you an example? I would love that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, at some point, it may be useful to make a distinction between what Wilbur would call stages of development or structures of development and states of spiritual realization. So at some point, you may want to talk about that because there was a bit of a conflation in how I heard you repeat things back. So Then let's do that now because I want to okay. learn on that conflation. Okay. And, yeah. and, and I think there's also really use, a lot of usefulness in articulating sort of some of the things you just pointed to. Okay. So um, when we talk about something like stages of cognitive development or stages of moral development or stages of spiritual development, we're talking about um, structures of mind. And these develop in a predictable unfold unfolding pattern throughout the course of someone's life. But it's important to realize that um, these structures of how we orient towards spirituality um, don't aren't actually the same thing as these sort of st stages of realization or stages of spiritual awakening. One could be at a fundamentalist or more what we'd call the, uh, an orientation that thinks that their particular tradition, the one they've inherited, is the only right tradition without mm -hmm. reflecting on it, mm -hmm. and they can still have authentic spiritual realization. So you have to think about two different vectors, one vector horizontal and, and horizontal and one vertical. Mm -hmm. So you can be anywhere on that vertical spectrum of development, but you can still wake up across that horizontal spectrum. So it's what, one of the contributions of Wilbur's work and some of the work that I've tried to continue out is to show that um, spiritual awakening and spiritual development through these structures is actually are, un are unique. And the reason that's so vital is because someone could be, again, a, a fundamentalist, meaning that they're not very high in their spiritual intelligence, um, but still have authentic spiritual realization or spiritual experiences. Someone could also be extremely high in their spiritual realize their spiritual intelligence, but maybe haven't had very many spiritual insights or sp aren't very spiritually awake. So we need both of these. Mm -hmm. One of the simplest ways that I describe mm -hmm. this is that we need to be both woke, meaning that through our spiritual development, we understand the plurality of existence, we understand how systems interact, with each other, we understand social inequalities, etc., and we need to be awake. We need to be both woke and awake. Woke meaning that we have a capacity to understand the complexity of our current systems, and awake meaning that we've come to know ourselves as this unbounded wholeness. So you can be mm. awoke and not wake. Uh, you can be woke but not awake, and wake but not woke. We need both of those. Okay, okay, this is helping. So on a wokeness is the realization of pluralism mm -hmm. on paths and then awakeness is the experiential wisdom of timeless unbounded wholeness that's a good way to articulate it yeah it's a bit more okay. complex than that but i think for the simple purposes of our what we're doing it's a great way to understand great. it great okay mm -hmm interesting interesting i and i can totally now see where we a may accidentally slip into only being one of those um two 
and then many people are yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay interesting so many we, people can yeah. understand the polarity of big spiritual traditions or understand the ways in which social context influence sort of inequality and things like this on sort of uh, for different forms of inequity or social injustice that's a very important definition of how we need to become more woke or more uh, uh, developed with our spiritual intelligence and our sort of broad intelligences in general but those people aren't necessarily awake to the fact that they are unbounded wholeness with no separation from everyone and everything and vice versa is also true we know many many spiritual teachers who have authentic awakening but don't quite understand the dimensions of plurality that we're speaking about both of those coexist excellent. we need both excellent thank you for um helping me with that that's crucial for my understanding mm -hmm. um, and hopefully for others as well and now let's do the yes. examples yes. so so you were speaking uh, a bit about the differences between how paths may unfold i want to give you one example um one of the teachings that i learned from uh from ken wilber early in my 20s was something called uh, the three faces of god so i want to unpack that a little mm -hmm. bit so in our basic language structure we have the uh, orientations using first person, second person, and third person language. First person means I, or following subjectivity. Second person meaning thou, or an I thou. And third person meaning an it. So different spiritual systems have developed with biases towards these various perspectives. So for example, a Buddhist tradition, in the way that we've inherited in the West, it's a little bit different in its native context, um, focuses on a first person perspective. You trace your own awareness and you trace that subjectivity all the way back to its source, which can be this type of unbounded open awareness. Um, the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition and the Islamic tradition tend to take a second person relationship towards ultimate reality, meaning there's an I-thou relationship. Um, forms of prayer are often very common in these traditions where there's a relationship with reality. It's not about tracing your own first person awareness back to its source. It's about being in such close devotion and relationship with the divine that you actually find yourself merging. Wow. Um, ultimately, there's a third person perspective, and I like to use Neil deGrasse Tyson as one of the examples of this, like someone who's so fascinated with the cosmos, yeah, yeah. he's in <laughs> awe constantly because of how the cosmos is such a miracle. Yeah. And if we take that orientation, like the Carl Sagan approach or yeah. the, the yeah, Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson approach, yeah. we can actually feel the excitement and the awe and the surrender that's released in our being, but there's no relationship and there's not a first person subjectivity that you're tracing back. What you're doing is that you're relating to ultimate reality is a great it this amazing amazing unfolding but it's objectified now all those are, are very different perspectives and they lead to very different types of realization but underneath that sort of surface feature the deep structure is similar that it leads towards some sort of opening or some sort of liberation yeah. some sort of freedom yeah. and i think that's what's important that sometimes the perennialists who want to say everything leads to the same thing they sometimes miss that distinction mm. that there are different perspectives what dan brown calls biasing perspectives that lead towards different types of realization but the fundamental underlying structure there's something that there's there's a liberation that can unfold yeah. is actually the same across traditions whoa okay i feel like I use the transcendence, uh, yeah. and then you use liberation. Yep, field. we can use either one. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Often a transcendence of the separate self, or transcendence yeah, yeah, of the individual yeah. relative yes. self. Yes, 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 yes. But remember, brother, this yes. is something that's so important for the youth, for the yes. readers, listeners to understand. Transcendence is always a transcendent include. Mm -hmm. What sometimes happens in people who are just being oriented towards spirituality is they start to identify with transcendence and they reject or deny their sense of relative self. And um, it's really, really important that we're a healthy relative self uh, even as we transcend that self into a larger ultimate reality. Yeah. So spiritual realization is a process of transcending and including, including the relative self, but also transcending it to establish your identity as something much wholer, wider, larger. Yeah. This reminds me of what Jack Engler says, where Jack Engler says, you have to be somebody before you can be nobody, right? So it's really important to be somebody, and then you can step into the fact that you're nobody, but that nobody then lives through this relative sense of somebody. Yes. And the two aren't separate. The two are actually the part of an integrated whole. Yes, and there's yes. many people in the spiritual community who I've interacted with and who I've uh, seen who make this air that they transcend and don't include. So they're spaced out rather than spacious or they're disconnected, spiritually bypassing all of their relative experience rather than fully integrated and feeling how painful it is to be a human being. We want to do both of those. We want to feel and be totally human and we want to understand fully through our direct experience that we're also much more than that. Yeah. Whoa. 
Yeah. As though at the earliest parts of the adventure of consciousness, there are the feelings of self, then there is the exploration of all of the paths and the feelings of transcending self, and then there is the process of including, um, which uh, which is uh, hi highly um, uh, around us uh, having a uh, a, 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 a wise uh, moment to moment experience with the self, the unbounded, timeless wholeness. Um, also, the in the in this previous bit where you're where you're where you're taking us, there's this, um, f there's this layer of, of, um, liberation that can be, s um, reached through myriad processes and we've been talking so much on the program about the beauty of the merging of uh, science and spirituality in a uh, in a harmony towards the architecting of a more prosperous world and in a sense that is this um, I really appreciated your breakdown because I've sampled now those three that you've list that you listed where we take the perspective of the Buddhist awareness going to source through our awareness through the vehicle itself the I thou relationship with the divine um and then the um being just profoundly awakened to um, divinity through understanding how a cell works mm -hmm. or how quantum mechanics works mm -hmm. or orbital dynamics or whatever aspect um, I think for me having felt these different structures has been uh, paramount in my ability to be open and loving and compassionate mm -hmm. to uh, other people on their journeys mm. and the way that they're finding their processes. Yeah, and how are you orienting now between those perspectives? Which one is the most resonant for you? Or maybe it's a combination of all of them. Yes. A... D drop merging with the ocean seems to be the most which p is likely the uh, first the buddhist through the through the mm -hmm. eye um it seems to be the most common through the eye to source mm -hmm. um but um like whenever my world view becomes I get a eureka moment in my world view so, a lot of times from the drop merging with ocean, but also from the uh, me crying at um, what are some of these like source codes within creation, within source that have made this reality and unpacking those with the scientific method you see a lot of beauty in that process mm -hmm. and so i'm crying a lot from that um as well and uh, and so that like yeah what about you that's beautiful i'm just happy you shared thank you i find that these all pers all these perspectives aren't mutually exclusive like you're saying I mean, we can take that subjective first person view all the way to its end back to source and this sort of broad open lucid unbounded awareness is here that's not separate from anything and at the same time we can be in radical devotion from this relative self towards a divine or towards the beauty and fascination of of 
the amazing way that the universe unfolds. And I find that these perspectives enrich each other. Yeah. And that as we develop along the path, that it's actually, there's a fullness that comes from taking all three perspectives simultaneously. Many people, in my experience, are uh, impoverished because they've cut out one of these perspectives, particularly people in Western culture who were raised in an inherited way. They inherited sort of a Judeo-Christian orientation. And so very naturally, as they began to question that, they often reject that particular view and they lean towards something like science or something like Buddhism. So either a third person or a first person orientation. And it's been my experience, at least in my own life and the people that I've worked with, is that when we include that second person perspective, there's an incredible richness that comes with that. It allows us to actually be in a loving universe and in relationship with a loving universe, not just a magical universe that we're in awe about and not just a universe that is no separate, not separate from our own awareness, mm -hmm. but in relationship with the universe in a way that's incredibly nurturing. And so I, I, I really encourage people to explore these, particularly if they've had some sort of break or rejection where they've moved into more of this atheistic view because mm. they are scientific or rational. You know, these all can coexist. It's really rich. Ah, <sighs> yes. It seems as though that may be one of the most uh, paramount things to happen uh, around our world is for the hyper rational um, technology builders, scientists uh, to um, experience some of these uh, uh, spiritual paths um, that may give them a deeper ethical, moral, or philosophical grounding that um, will help prevent issues that may come from developing said science and technologies into the world and ensure that they um, are built for maximizing prosperity and abundance and flourishing uh, that seems to be something especially close to the hearts of areas that have such great influence like Hollywood and uh, Silicon Valley to, um, to have these experiences that help with what we're actually architecting. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we have to have right motivation. We have to have right motivation to create the world that is going to benefit everyone. And sometimes these experiences that we're talking about can help encourage people to have good motivation because they start to understand the magnificence of reality and that they can be participants in that reality and contributors to it, not just people who are uh, consuming and taking for their own sort of selfish desires and needs. I think it's extremely important what you're saying, what you're speaking about. The word reciprocity mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. a crucial pillar in my realization of that. Every breath of air, every sip of water, every bite of food, every every shower, every show using this equipment, every beautiful moments that I get with other people in their eyes, that having deep reciprocity towards our planet that sustains us towards each other. Mm. Um, How do you keep that in mind when you're breathing, for example? How do you keep that reciprocity in mind? What do you do moment to moment or kind of orientation do you have? It would be useful for people to hear. appreciate the amount of tennis balls that you hit back um, my way. Um, I think it's 600 shows, you know. Well, <laughs> someone's got to ask you some good questions. Um, yeah, there, whenever that does happen, there's really good formulations on, on my end that help a lot. And in answer to this one, I've passed a lot of feeling now on what has been a, uh, a, um, an, a hydrological cycle or an, an air cycle that has been here since billions of years prior to me and that I am still today um, 
a recipient of mm. phytoplankton and trees mm. that are providing me with the oxygen that I breathe and that um, the same water that I drink today is what dinosaurs drank. And mm. that I, when I tie myself in like that, um, and when I even sit here and breathe, that we can melt into those breaths the sip of water we can melt into the sip of water it's just it's a um i keep hearing this word so much practice it's about practice mm. practice that moment to moment timeless unbounded wholeness and then you become that mm. but like it's practice and so that's mm. probably my um feeling is that I'm, 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 a, I'm a work in progress towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, what, how about you? I love those examples of you. I think they're fantastic. That's a, a way that you're bringing it into your everyday life, moment by moment, if you can remember to do it. Yeah. For me, the key to practice, to you know, keep building on this term, is to remember to practice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, many of us know what to do, we just forget. <laughs> It's one of the basic fundamental... The key to practice is to remember to practice. <laughs> it's true. I mean, one of the fundamental poisons within the Tibetan uh, world that I've been immersed in is, is ignorance, is that we forget. We're deluded and we forget. And um, for me, this is what mentors are all about. My main mentor, Dan Brown, uh, uh, in the, the world of Tibetan Buddhism and meditation, one of the first questions I asked him, I, I said... Dan, you know, I've had some of these experiences of being so this open, unbounded awareness. Is it possible, like, to have that all the time? He said to me, that's the whole point. <laughs> the whole point is to actually have that moment by moment, to not forget. Yes. Because the tendency is to forget over and over again. And there's all kinds of ways that we can build out structures in our life to support that. But one of the most basic ways to start building it out is through a meditation practice. And if you think about a meditation practice, you can think of it from sort of the neuroscientific lens. You can think of it through a peak performance lens where you're developing concentration. You're really making your mind fit for flow states. You can yeah. use all that language. Yeah. I think a more, uh, for me, a more profound and a deeper way is that you're actually going to take time to remember. You're going to take time to not forget because so much of our life is based on forgetting what we know intuitively. That part of our own awareness, you know, it said many of us have tasted awakening many times before, but we've just forgotten. <laughs> so take time to remember this root of religion, this root meaning like to, to rejoin. To rejoin, to yeah. Remember. yeah. To remember. All of us are just so forgetful. And so for me, practice is simply about remembering and developing the structures in our life and the relationships in our life that help us remember moment to moment. Then if we remember, we're in a much better position to help others and to create the world that we want to create. But if we forget and we're acting from all of our unconscious motivations, then we're going to create more of the world that we've seen so far. So we have to remind each other. Yeah. <laughs> moment by moment. And remind ourselves. It's true Sangha. Sangha is a word in the Buddhist community. It means, means you know, a group of practitioners who are committed to each other's realization and practice. In Sangha, we're here to remind each other, to, hey, don't forget. <laughs> My wife tugs on our ear. If we're yeah. in public and she yeah. sees that I've totally forgotten, oh, she just wow. goes, hey. Wow. She, she reminds me. She helps me remember. What a cool sign. Yeah, we can do it for each other, right? Yeah. Mm. So during the interview, I might, I might do a little tug or something. Yeah. Wow. For those that are open to taking a similar uh, ear tug for remembering, mm. please. That's a really fun mm. one. Mm. Um, for those also that are open to at that this is maybe a good question to ask is uh what for sangha we surround ourselves usually with people that are committed to the practice of remembering mm -hmm. on a moment-to-moment -moment basis yet we usually um as the great quote goes if you think you are enlightened spend a month with your family mm -hmm. um <laughs> Uh, what do we do about our, you know, our parents mm. th that we love 
so dearly uh yet that uh don't necessarily want to play the <laughs> yeah maybe there's some you know maybe there's folks being born at least in the last generation who actually had parents who did remember yes we're in good shape you know yes, and this yes. is how the evolution of of spiritual teachings actually really take root is that you do have parents who remember but if many of us didn't have parents who remembered so i think one of the best ways is to first understand that um, it's understandable that we forget in the presence of family, in the presence of teachers, because, or the presence of parents, because our relative sense of self was formed in the presence, in the cauldron of our family structure. And our relative sense of self being pulled back into that sort of smaller <laughs> self is often uh, what happens when we're in family. It's wow. totally understandable. Wow. That's how it was formed. We can have compassion for ourselves. But as we deepen our practice and we can be hyper aware and vigilant as we go into those situations, then it's natural that we remember more and more in those situations. It no longer has that kind of pull. And then we naturally butterfly effect our timeless unbounded wholeness to our... But often it doesn't show up as a transmission of that timeless boundless awareness. It shows up as a transmission of kindness or yes, something else yes. that's beneficial. Um, I think there might be people who are fortunate enough to have parents who are open to that. My parents have both expressed interest in their own ways and that type of thing. My like father sat on retreat with Dan Brown. He did? Such wow. Such a special thing for me. Wow. Mm. Whoa. Mm. That is so neat. Yeah, and we've had friends that have said that uh, they've had, um, yeah, really strong b butterfly effects where their parents have then, uh, there's been catalyzation of some sort of inquiry from them about mm. the why, what's this bliss state that you're mm. <laughs> best thing we do is be an example uh, again I, i'm quoting dan so much just because i've learned so much from him and he's had such a profound impact on me he often says better to be a buddha than a buddhist so it's better to actually be a living example of what's possible rather than try to you know convince people through your words or language it's we have to really embody it we know we know deep practice and remembrance through conduct and how we show up in the world. So showing up and being the teachings is the best thing we can possibly do. Yeah, that's it. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another question that is um, of great uh, inquiry to, to um, me uh, right now uh, we've been playing with a lot is uh, is um, this reality a a perfect harmonization or flux of good and evil in Tibetan teachings there's a, a perspective or deity called Samantabhadra and this perspective is that um, what it means, or sometimes how it's translated, is everything good. And from that particular perspective, um, the idea that there's something wrong or there's something evil that you're in harmony with, is it, it's sort of a, a, a moot question. So from that perspective, everything is good. Everything's here to show us our way back onto the path. That reality itself is uh, constantly... Uh, trying everything it can to, to reveal itself to itself. And if we take that perspective, then everything is a gift along the path. Everything is a gesture of compassion to show us our way home. So from that perspective, I don't think that we're in some sort of dualistic battle between good and evil and there's a perfect harmony and these kind of things. I think everything from the right view is a orientation to bring us back more deeply and more fully to our own true nature, to our own realization. That perspective resonates with me much more and it tends to be a very effective way to live and to practice. Wow. So could it be then that this is a perfect a pressure cooker, reality a perfect pressure cooker for the spiritual path? Yeah. The reality is here for the benefit of its own realization through all of us as you know, we experience more and more of its unfolding. That that is the process that's unfolding, is that we're in the pressure cooker of realization. <laughs> and that if we actually allow ourselves to um, align as fully as we possibly can with that intention, that motivation, not just to awaken for our own benefit, but to awaken so that we can participate in the fullness of this 
gloriful experience uh, and for the benefit of others, then, you know, it's a pretty magical universe to live in. It's hard to live in that perspective all the time, but that's what remembering is all about. And when we're not in that perspective, it's okay. We forget from time to time and we suffer deeply as a result. And um, my uh, dear friend of mine often says, uh, you know, pain is inevitable and suffering is optional. Right? So the yep. ways in which we're hurt and that reality is actually deeply traumatic moment to moment um, doesn't go away even as we develop deeper on the path. But our perspectives change. And there is a point where we no longer are suffering when pain arises, but it actually allows us to feel more fully. And as we feel experience more fully, our heart opens to feel others experience more fully. <laughs> and it becomes this amazing virtuous cycle of feeling and orienting towards a tenderness of what it's like to be human, yeah. while we're also simultaneously recognizing that we're in the pressure cooker of reality revealing itself to itself, which is also awesome. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how does one um, being born in Columbus, Ohio, and then mm -hmm. Uh, pursuing Cornell and pursuing Harvard, um, studies of religion, um, uh, getting involved with uh, Ken for 15 years, mm -hmm. Dan for 12 years. Um, how have you been on the, the process of navigating to identify? And then you yourself, how do you, you know, parse for the, the things that are working for you? Mm. You know, when I, um, when I was in my early 20s, uh, I'd, I'd spent time living in Paris after Cornell. I'd moved to India to be a monk. Uh, I'd lived this sort of very dualistic lifestyle. Eventually settled in Denver, Colorado, where I met Ken Wilbur. And uh, I'd written him a letter, and I said, I really want to come work with you. I've done all these different things, but I want to find a middle way. And uh, his Integral Institute at the time was something that really resonated with me. Um, as I found my way deeper into relationship with Ken, what I found in him was a theoretical model of how all these pieces that seemed to be separate from me could all fit together into a comprehensive whole. This, what, what he's called integral theory, sort of an integrated worldview. It was so helpful for me because up until that point, I had all these different areas of interest, but I didn't quite see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. What integral theory does is it allows you to put all the pieces on the table across all different cultures and throughout time and different, different epochs of time. Wow. And we can then say, oh, there are these patterns that emerge. Yep. This is what it means to be human. This is what we've inherited through history. This is what we've inherited as a great human civilization. How to, Let's build a map and let's build actual practices that act it. Yeah. So that's what I learned from Ken on, on one side. What I also learned from Ken was that Ken and the way he showed up, his loving presence and the way that he was like unbrokenly caring when I'd interact with him, it showed me an example of what it means to love. So I often say from Ken, I learned two things. One is I learned how everything fits together, which was really useful, <laughs> but I also learned how to love. Yeah. I didn't know how to love until I met someone like Ken. So Ken was what sort of brought me on to a deeper um, like practice-based path, meaning that like right now in the moment, this matters and how I'm relating to you matters. Yes. A few years later, I met Dan Brown, and Dan was really who like put the rocket fuel in my personal practice because the Tibetan teachings that he's trained in for 40 years and then his clinical practice that he's had at Harvard for also around 35, 40 years, it was like I had stumbled upon this gold mine of wealth and information, both on the clinical side and the Tibetan side. And I often say Tibet is like the Silicon Valley of the mind. <laughs> so Tibetan culture was isolated on this plateau for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it just became this incubator for transformative practice because the invaders couldn't get in. It was just, it was amazing. So we have all these practices. When China came into Tibet and the, the reorientation happened, the Tibetans all became refugees and that Dharma spread throughout the world. It's been wow. this amazing gift. And so from wow. Dan, what I learned was like, wow, people have actually come to understand how, what are the practices step by step that we can do to take somebody from ordinary everyday suffering into a level of practice and realization where they actually experience themselves as this 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 drop merging with the ocean they experience themselves as the ocean yeah. and how do we stabilize that moment to moment how do we take that into dreaming how do we take that into deep sleep yeah. how do we allow ourselves to unfold on a path where 
all of the time we're remembering. And the Tibetans have figured this stuff out. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's amazing what's built into this tradition that I've been able to learn from Dan and that, I, that I'm sharing with others. So I found my way onto the path somewhat through accident, but also through just incredible um, uh, good fortune, you know, good fortune that I've met people like Ken and through uh, Ken and Dan. This might have been the first time that I heard that the traumas of Tibet were, and that Dharma is spreading around the world are actually being viewed as one of the greatest treasures of mm. it being spread. Mm. Um, and it's I'm a, not sure that's a popular view. Uh, it's the first time. Yeah, mm. I'm here. here I don't think. Yeah, actually, one of the most common themes of the different guests that we have on the program is that they've seen their greatest traumas as their greatest treasures mm. it's a very common theme so we can look at globally great traumas that are exactly. great treasures exactly mm -hmm. which is very hard to also think about given the great deal of like trauma from like a transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. um <clears throat> to uh, see treasures from like a scramble for Africa or from all the different genocides that have happened across the planet. Like there's, it's really hard. Um, but it's also really important to heal, uh, on a, both an individual level, seeing treasures and also on a collective level from these bigger traumas, mm -hmm. seeing, seeing treasures. That was very interesting. What you mentioned then also Ken in many ways reminds me of what it feels like my, um, next chapter that source is channeling through is meant to be um, there's uh, a lot that is coming into our daily reality as unstructured data and anyone worth their salt in the field of deep learning will tell you that um, structured data is extremely important and that if you want to make models make find patterns structuring data like this reality being filled with so much what feels like noise and signal at the same time and being able to structure all of the different pockets of signal into a cohesive map or canon of all of the different signals and what people can go and and we remove the fog of war we remove the veil and we give people ability to see the signals experience the signals find what works for them and go find the water um and you're you're very fortunate because you got two wit that I would say are um, at the absolute cutting edge, Ken and Dan, mm -hmm. and that's really important for you passing along. Now you have a great responsibility to continue passing this along. And you do. You've now, how many meditation retreats have you co-led um, slash led? How many have you have you done now? With Dan or just in, in general? general? In general oh, and many, with Dan. Many, many retreats. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. one of the biggest gifts of studying with Dan has been an apprenticeship model. A model where um, there is a... Uh, learning by doing where i'd sit with him on retreat he's right next to me yeah. we're teaching together he's obviously has you know 40 years more experience than me so i'm a baby when it comes to this but he sits me in the seat to actually start learning how to do it i'll make a comment he'll whisper something in my ear a little tweak or a correction i could do this type of relational based practice and mentorship that i've received is absolutely incredible and i'd say the same thing um with with ken in that ken and i now have a course on insight timer for example yeah. where we we talk about the, um, the importance of what we call wake up, grow up, clean up, show up, which we can talk about at some point in time. Wow. But this, this whole idea of teaching with somebody and, pres and preserving the wisdom that they've been able to, to sort of come to yes. is something I feel so passionate about. 
So for example, Dan for 40 years has taught with the Tibetans side by side and has helped to preserve these teachings in a way that makes them living and alive in the West, not just through book form, but through like real life sitting next to each other and sharing. Yeah. And you know, for the past six years of, of training, Dan's given me this opportunity to sit with him and to train and to learn and, to, and then to share that with, with students. So my hope with all of this is that there's an ongoing preservation of what's come and what we've all inherited. And for that, it's just like nothing but um, unbelievably heartfelt gratitude. Like you were saying, like the water you drink, if you can take that orientation, the dinosaurs drink the same water, like as you drink it, there's no other experience you can have other than gratitude. It's yes. like, oh, I'm so grateful and you can savor it. Yes. So there's an aspect of my experience that just is so grateful for everything that I've received and how I can you know, express it. And always what happens with spiritual teachings is that they have to meet the current time and the different dynamics that are present in the current situation. So in addition to preservation, there's always innovation. So it's this dance between preserving the essence and innovating in the most relevant and potent way wow. for this particular moment in time. So preservation, innovation, and it's that dialectical tension between those two. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people lean too far on the innovation side, and when they lean too far on the innovation side, they forget the preservation. Sometimes people lean too far on the preservation side, and they aren't present with the current context of what's most helpful now yes. in these circumstances. And so, of course, we need both of those. And, you know, I, like other people in my generation, are in these positions where we're trying to hold that balance. And, you know, imperfectly as we're doing it, we're like, we're, there's a lot of us who are very earnest in trying to do it well. Like Tibetan Buddhism meeting TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> what does that look like? What does that look like? I don't know what that looks like. But I'm sure we'll yeah. find out in some sure ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's also this danger in the innovation side that like we dilute things. And so it's always about preserving the essence in the way that doesn't dilute anything. And so, you know, can we do something on TikTok that won't dilute it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. There have been a, a couple um, of those very uh, short um, videos of, of that I've seen that are trying to communicate some sort of um, timeless spiritual wisdom in one of the short TikTok videos, and it, I, th I think it works more for those that are already um, somewhere along the path because it kind of causes them to like reflect for that like little fifteen second period. But the one of the things is that th then the scroll goes to just the next mm -hmm. v video, which is usually something around like entertainment, mm -hmm. um, which can sometimes take us out of that, mm -hmm. that state. So um, I'm not even sure how those things harmonize a 15 second like attention um, video generation um, harmonizing with the what requires a very, very serious focused practice um, of uncovering the nature of reality through awareness and through breath um, to source. That's, uh, that's, there's, it seems to be lots of incompatibilities with the 15 um, second mm. uh, video scrolling app. And so that's just something that um, to consider, but also to try and find. I really, okay. You let's let's hit let's hit this from where you initially started it, which is that uh, you are now responsible for the preservation and innovation simultaneously of what you've been gifted, and likewise, I am as well with what we've been gifted on the program, the preservation and innovation of all of these different things that we've been taught. Mm -hmm. And so there's something here that has now come up over and over and over again, which is that we're going through an ethnographic condensation where you have 7,000 languages currently spoken that are half are not being taught to children mm -hmm. so it's already dropping to 3500 and there's just a greater and greater push for people to solely be learning english or learning uh, mandarin or etc and so uh, we have also a responsibility 
to preserve culture around the planet because there's pockets of great timeless spiritual wisdom that occur in many of the first nations in Canada or in um, the Native Americans in the U.S. or in the uh, the plethora of um, indigenous cultures in uh, in uh, in in Latin America, so in Africa, there's just there's so many pockets that exist like that, and that basically indigeneity has been like this is a, such a common thing on the program. Curious to hear how you feel about it. Ninety nine point nine percent of 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 human time has been in indigeneity and then agrarian society 10,000 years and then especially uh, enlightenment and industrial revolution 500 and so to and that's only 0.1% of time of being human and so to think that all of our wisdom is concentrated in modernity is hubristic it's myopic, and it needs a humility check. Mm -hmm. well, not only uh, uh, in in sort of the modern era, but also in sort of mostly the the Western modern era. I mean, there's um, I, I used to always give this uh, teaching, and it's very imperfect, but it's sometimes useful. So uh, as a as a sort of a teaching tool, pedagogical tool, is that. Um, what I really aspire to is a deep integration of north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. And let me just say a bit about sort of what I see as some of the gifts of these different broad swaths. And it's imperfect because none of these communities are, you know, homogeneous and they're not monolithic and there's so much diversity within them. But yeah. just for the sake of, um, of, of like a broader orient orientation. Mm -hmm. So what the Western world has really offered us an incredible, a, a few incredible tools, many incredible tools, but this idea of sort of a rational scientific lens that allows us to actually have a hypothesis to test it out and to check the results that are reliable and repeatable. This is really, this is cool. And mm -hmm. this, this capacity to understand sort of the broader unfolding in sort of a process oriented or an evolutionary context. You just laid out sort of some of the epics of humanity from sort of early indigenous to agrarian to industrial to maybe information to maybe something more integrative, et cetera. So that's really valuable to sort of see things in these broad strokes. I think that's useful. That's one of the gifts of the Western mind. At the same time, um, when it, some of the, the gifts that come from, say, like the Tibetan culture or some of these more Eastern embedded cultures are that the, um, if we actually examine our own subjective experience and we actually notice, notice that moment to moment there is an awareness, even though things seem to be unfolding in this evolutionary way, there's an aspect of our experience that's always here. That's interesting. Now it's a new moment, but like there's an aspect of experience that's still right now. It's aspect of our experience. It's still right now. It was here when our, we were a child. It's here now. It's mm -hmm. now a few seconds later than I first said it, but there's this aspect of experience that's here now. Mm -hmm. We start to understand there's an aspect of, of our own experience or awareness that's beyond the coming and going of time. If we take that even further and we start to explore, we begin to realize, wow, that awareness isn't separate. It actually is huge. It's beyond our physical body. It's unbounded. It's timeless. It's unbounded. It's whole. When we integrate these two perspectives, we get this timeless, unbounded awareness that's also, you know, seeing itself show up and evolving within time. That's very cool, East and West integration. Mm -hmm. From the North and the South, what I find is that there's these, these rich traditions, these rich indigenous traditions that are actually holding a wisdom around how we actually come into a deeper harmony with the natural world. Yeah. A deeper harmony with the natural world through, you know, the way that we eat food, the way that we build community, the way that we interact with each other. And also because of that deep harmony with the natural world, there's an incredible understanding around uh, medicines and healing, but also around the ways in which uh, plants and entheogens can actually transform the way we experience reality. Yes. So there's this amazing capacity for these indigenous cultures and tribes to teach us about how we be in relationship with each other, how we're in relationship with the earth, and how we're in relationship with these, these amazing kingdoms of plants and animals and you know uh, minerals yes. and so there's something about this trans kingdom harmony that comes from the north and the south when we combine that view with this evolutionary view and this unbounded wholeness view we get a bit more sort of sophisticated or sophisticated orientation to how we might live both in re right relationship but also with right realization and also in sort of the right unfolding of evolutionary time in process 
And to me, that's a much fuller realization. And that's, these are some of the things that I've learned through my study with Wilbur, is that these perspectives can all fit together, and they're all holding a piece of the puzzle. One of the things that Wilbur says I love, he says, no one is smart enough to be 100% wrong. Right? So what that means is that everybody is holding some piece of a truth, and they're also partial. So everything is true but partial. So when we begin to look at the world with a, a hermeneutic of generosity, we interpret the world with a generous spirit. We begin to say, oh, well, there must be some truth in that. Even if there's a lot of it that might be partial, there's something true there. And we begin to look at the world with this generous spirit. We see, oh, everything actually has something to offer, something to contribute. And that, to me, is the gift of an integral theory, is that we begin to see a much more robust and rich and pluralistic experience of reality that also is unfolding throughout time in a really incredible way that can benefit all of us and the planet and beyond. To me, that's super exciting. So North, South, East, West, this is the, the global wisdom tradition that's unfolding as an integration of all these streams into one great human tradition. Yes. Wow, I really like that. Yeah, the North, South, East, West. <sighs> What's your experience with some of these indigenous cultures and ways in which we can learn from our, you know, the, the Kogi and the Andes call themselves the you know, older brothers and sisters yeah. of humanity. They, yeah. You know, there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. But how, what's your relationship with some of these, these different groups of people and whether we look at cultural systems or just your own experience with some of these things? I really like the way that you phrase, framed it. I think that's a really strong analogy that seems like it's actually very much so a on a, on a compass they're just they're they're so um integral to, to one another and to this uh this new world that we're all uh part of the evolutionary process of I, I, i'm yeah my my relationships with that north south east and west are uh as you described um as we've been describing throughout that um i i, I love the th i love the paths in those and that my sampling of the paths of those have been instrumental to my own um spiritual path but also my um hopefully ability to uh help empathize with people that are on their paths sampling their processes of awakening relating with them being a getting into dialectic with them about them and then also um on the on the program as well trying to take these great uh analogies and um hopefully have them be a centerpiece of of discourse in in society because this spiritual path is uh the path and it is um being the fundamental layer in our social fabric would be uh, transformative and you mentioned this throughout and i think it's so important to 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 point it out we talk about this so much that having <clears throat> sitting there with like Dan Brown or Ken Wilbur and having a a mentor, a one-on-one -on -one mentorship, which has so many studies through Bloom 2 Sigma and all these other studies showing that you perform just exceptionally as an outlier beyond an average when uh, you have one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And mm -hmm. so in this case, uh, I and other um, viewers get one-on-one -on -one mentorship from all of the guests that come onto the program. You have the one-on-one -on -one mentorship of Dan and Ken in their states of uh, communicating what they uh, hope to inspire other people to awaken with. And it's a very common theme for people that come on the program as well to say things like, if you want to get involved in an in a field or an industry uh, or on the spiritual path, what better way than to tell the uh, than to reach out to the people that are at the cutting edge of those fields, industries, paths, and say, "Hey, 
uh, I would like to get involved and I'm willing to uh, work for free and no one's going to do a better job than me. I'm dedicated to succeeding for you, for the edge that you're pushing and learning from you directly as a mentor one-on-one. And that young person is going to set themselves drastically apart from their peers because they're willing to go into the edge for one-on-one mentorship for free and do work that is for on behalf of that edge pushing that is um, hopefully a really good, great quality and uh, maybe even leads them to uh, an actual paid uh, position within that, um, within that afterward. Yeah. Comment on that. For Please. A second? Yeah. You know, I think it's really important here to mention privilege. Yeah. You know, I hear like the, the, I'm, I have so much, I need to become so much more woke and I recognize that like, yeah. I'm not very woke. Me too. And I want to say that I just recognize that the position and the articulation that was just outlined, it comes from extreme privilege perspective, even the idea of working for free, free and all yeah, these things. Yeah. Um, that's not necessary. It's, it's not, I want to just be really clear that this mentorship relationship isn't necessary to um, enter in and start the sort of journey of your own transformation and your own spiritual path. Um, one of the groups that I, I'm, I'm so excited about working with is called CredibleMind.com. And Credible Mind has, has assimilated all these different practices for mental health and spiritual growth. And we've taken a whole panel of experts and given all these resources ratings and we have user ratings. And it basically is like the substitute mentor. Because one of the things that I got from Dan and Ken is they said, oh, try this, read this book, check this out. Check it. But if we look at the, the swath of spiritual text today and text about mental health and well-being, there is information overload. We're, we're content obese with this type of information. Yeah. This maybe we were speaking to with like unstructured information. Yeah. There's so much of it. And so what we've tried to do with Credible Mind is say, okay, let's start sorting through some of these things. Let's start positioning things with, with saying, oh, this is actually expert rated. This has five stars written, you know, rated by experts, all the best mentors. So I just want to say that that privileged perspective is now being supplemented with a totally free resource of people to say, here are the best things that help you along your spiritual path. Here are the things that are evidence-based. Here are the things that are really work for your mental health and for your flourishing in life. And so I just wanted to mention that because um, this, this yeah. sort of democratization of some of this information is so yeah. vital that it's not just quality sacked into communities of, of privilege and, and to the elite. So there is something available. CrediblemindCom is one, and there's many, many others. Cre- credible, credible mind, credible, credible mind. mind, credible mm-hmm. mind.com. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Oh, we'll also that link we'll put in the bio as well Great. for people. Credible mind.com. The democratization of awakening is incredible and it is also different to read or watch about it um, than it is to have a one-on-one with Dustin Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. um, help that helps me on the path so there's a a, a friend of mine named uh, Bruce Lyon and he once told me a metaphor that I think is useful in this context and I hear a lot today about people talking about the democratization of, of enlightenment, democratization of spiritual awakening. And they say the age of the guru or the spiritual teacher is sort of over, and we now have access to all this information. So what I said before still, still stands. You can enter onto the spiritual path, and you can, so you can develop a huge, robust set of practices and teachings that are really, really helpful. And that is true, and that remains true. At the same time, it's really important at some point, if you can, to find someone who's actually uh, taken a few steps further than you. It doesn't have to be the people at the cutting edge and the best and the brightest, but someone who's just a little bit further along than you so you can have that direct relationship. So I want to share with you a metaphor. Um, uh, Bruce said to me, you know, we're moving from an era in which we have isolated suns with planets revolving around them. This is like the solar model of the spiritual teacher and the students who are the planets. Planets. So so it's like the orbit of the sun is the people who are sort of finding themselves in the orbit of the teacher. Moving from that type of model to more of a galactic model. And in a galactic model, we start to actually realize ourselves as suns. And we look around and we say, oh, there's another sun. There's a sun. There are all these illumined beings who start to recognize and notice each other. But those suns are actually centered around this amazing event horizon of a black hole yeah and that black hole nobody's in the center of that it's actually an infinite well of potential yeah. so we can actually see ourselves in different constellations as suns and we can stand around that event horizon of a black hole of that infinite potential emerging between us and through us that's a really cool model 
But the reason I like that model isn't just for the amazing metaphor of the black hole, but it's because that's a transcendent include model. Even those suns who are standing in formation together around the black hole may still have planets in their orbit because there is a point in time in a soul's evolution or an individual's development where they actually need the nourishment of a sun in order to actually light up themselves. Like we as Earth need the nourishment of the sun. It's really vital to our existence and to our survival. And so we can stand in that light and we can actually be nourished by that light until we ourselves become a sun. So I use that model because it's a transcendent include model. The age of the spiritual teacher, the age of the sun with planets planets isn't over. It's just been transcended into a much larger collective understanding that we can stand as suns in orbit around a black hole, but those suns may still have their own planets that they're lighting up to become suns. Suns, yes, yes. We need both. Yes, and that there may be suns that um, burn um, brighter and that we can that's right. also um, learn from, which is kind of like that, what you were saying earlier about finding someone that's a little bit more Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right, yeah. And that we begin to understand that, you know, the the galaxy isn't flat, but it's actually three dimensional. Yep. So there are some suns that are more developed in different areas than others. And so those suns continue to learn from each other and to evolve as they stand in that orbit together. So absolutely. I want to touch on the continued preservation and innovation of what the spiritual paths are bringing to light that we are also working with the combating of the ethnographic condensation to aim to uh, preserve. How does Bright Alliance mm. do such work? Great, thank you. So, Bright Alliance comes from this model of suns standing together. In the English language, this word bright is, is interesting. It means full of light. We also use it to mean intelligent. And the word alliance has this quality of being together, but also moving in a direction. So, what does it mean for um, bright suns to stand together, actually moving in a direction? Bright Alliance. So, the sun metaphor is actually the perfect setup for it. So, Bright Alliance is um, uh, in its sort of you know, it's been around for a few years now, and mainly it's on publishing. And so publishing is something that um, I never thought that I would get into, but it, t it turns to be a really great way to preserve things. So Bread Alliance has recently published um, five different volumes of translations from the Tibetan canon, the Bon Zogchen, it's called canon, that Dan Brown has translated with uh, someone named Geshe Sonam from the, the Bumpo tradition in Tibet. And this is the only time these books have been translated into English, and they've been preserved through this publishing house. So that's one example, is you know, someone like Dan and some of these other these, uh, Tibetan teachers uh, publishing work and preserving work through Bread Alliance. Um, but in, in, in the past, Bread Alliance has done other things, like Bread Alliance has helped to facilitate um, and explore what does it mean for different people who are looking for spiritual practice 2.0. So people have done a lot of their own individual work. They've done their own sort of shadow work and integration. They've been studying on a path for a while. They have some sense of this uh, remembering in their lives. But then they come together. And what are the practices that we can do together to enrich each other? Um, that practice 2.0, or what we used to call relational spiritual practice, was something the Bright Alliance was doing for quite a few years. It's been on break for a while, but I sense that that's coming back. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in doing is pulling together different teachers across multiple different lineages and exploring uh, the gifts of each of those lineages and seeing how they might contribute to a more global spirituality yeah. or a spirituality that's based on sort of the best of what we know about being human mm -hmm. historically and also what's emerging now. My sense is that we're reaching a time in our evolution as a human species where there, the individual spiritual teacher will begin to sort of unify into groups of spiritual teachers together across lineages and cultures. I often say that the individual spiritual teacher or lineage holder or, or realizer will, will sort of always be pushed to the side and the fringes of culture and society. 
But when we reach a point in the arc of our evolution as a human species, where people can come to enough of an understanding of the deeper spiritual path that they're standing on, even as the surface features remain different, when we get a group of people who can stand together across traditions, across cultures, across lineages, and can actually share in teaching and sharing humanity's wisdom all at once, there's a way in which that impulse won't be denied. It won't be able to be ignored on the world stage. So for me, Bright Alliance is a seed for the eventual coming together of a group of spiritual realizers, teachers, practitioners, to share what's more of a universal inheritance of human wisdom with the world in a really positive way. Um, so who knows? I mean, that could just be a pipe dream, and I'm okay with that too, but it seems like something uh, aspirational at the very least, that we might stand together and have benefit for others. Um, if something like that doesn't unfold, my wife is so good at teaching me that um, the moment-to-moment experiences that we have, every interaction we have, the way that we interact with the, the clerk, you know, the way that we interact with the drivers on the road, the way that we interact with ourselves, um, that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's the most important thing. If in addition to that, other things unfold, I think that's really positive, but they're not necessary. That's Bright Alliance. Yeah. The moment to moment practice of spiritual awakening being the greatest um, test and achievement and all and the conduct that emerges from that moment to moment practice conduct that mm-hmm. emerges from it. Yes. Yes. By their fruits, ye shall know them. Right. Is this phrase that's in both the New Testament and that William James often quotes and that my teacher Dan Brown often quotes. It's by the fruits you'll know true realizers by the fruits and the path that they leave behind them. So I often say to people who are interested in beginning to study with somebody or they want to test, you know, someone's practice, they should look at their history and notice all of their relationships and everything that they've left behind them. People of authentic awakening leave a wake of goodness in their past, no matter where they've gone. There's like, I, I visualize it like, yep. like, uh, like flowers floating behind somebody yes. on their path. Yes. And someone who, who is, anybody can be f- you know, fooled in the moment by someone's charisma and these things, and you have to look at their history. So this idea of, of conduct being the true sign of someone's practice, I think, is a really good one to live by. Look at where someone's been, how they've showed up, how they're showing up now, and how they continue to show up, and to go slow with your relationships with others and your relationships with teachers in general. And also keeping in mind the evolution of of people, the evolution of ethics, the evolution of um, our spiritual paths, because we also have a phenomenon that's happening where people are digging like five or ten years in the past and trying to... So happy you're saying that. Yeah. It actually is so uncompassionate yeah. to, um, to, go so, to, to go into someone's history in such a way that you're not actually seeing them fresh. So there's a balance between seeing history and being totally open to who somebody is in this moment, seeing them with fresh eyes and new eyes. And that's, I think, you know, the other pole of knowing someone's conduct and tracing it back. It's so knowing that you're open to them showing up in a new way for you in this moment to who they might have been five minutes ago. And when we balance a fresh perspective with examining conduct, I think then we have a really good integration of two views. Yeah. I like that. And I also like Bright Alliance's understanding that this timeless spiritual wisdom has been um, collectively you can look at the big huge planetary level of of timeless spiritual wisdom that's been evolving with us over time and to be able to both um, preserve it and innovate with it in the sense of meeting the information technology age but also in the sense of making novel connections between timeless spiritual wisdoms that have yet to be explored is Mm -hmm. really interesting to me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. feels like a very ripe moment in human evolution for us to be able to do that. Yeah. It's basically, again, what I'm um, going into the next chapter to do is, is that um, process of seeing the, um, the timeless collective uh, wisdoms of, of us and then finding patterns across them trying to uh find novel connections across them and then further disseminate those in novel uh, metaphors and uh, stories uh, that then uh, can be further built upon or critiqued or um or made new connections with etc to kind of evolve us us further um okay and 
I would like to ask you. This is probably um, useful for uh, me and for others because um, you, you referenced this earlier and this kind of happens a lot when we say words like uh, indigeneity or when we say a word like uh, uh, Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism even. There's still um, Mahamudra, Dzogchen. What are those breakdowns? And then, yeah, give us a little insight into that. Sure. Well, you know... As someone who studied religion, one of the first things I learned was that these, all these categories are inventions. We basically invented categories to, for convenience of study. And um, the real lived experience of any of these different traditions and lineage is so much more rich and dynamic than any of that. So mm -hmm. even the North, South, East, West, I mean, it's like it, it's useful for a moment and then it becomes totally irrelevant because it's so... Um, oversimplified it's not even useful so same thing when we talk about these different religious and spiritual traditions is that they're complex living organisms that are constantly changing and evolving okay with that caveat in place i'll say a little bit about how i've come to understand at least mahamudra and zogchen so within the tibetan tradition there was um there are several different main lineages of practice um the highest teaching in some of those lineages, so one lineage is called the Kagyu tradition. The highest teaching in that particular tradition is called Maha Mudra. Um, Maha means great, and Mudra means seal or gesture, so great seal or great gesture. What Maha Mudra is really excellent at is uh, articulating a step-by-step -step process by which one moves from ordinary consciousness to this unbounded wholeness or, or to awakened consciousness. It's extremely effective in doing that. Um, as I've studied with Dan and the teachings that he's learned from his own teachers like Geshe Wangyo and others, um, I've, I've, I'm learning and training to teach that. I don't have full permission to teach it, so I want to be very clear that I'm still training. I'm still, you know, and I'm still in apprenticeship. Um, but Mahamudra is excellent at that step-by-step -step path. So that's that path that we see with the that's different that's called the elephant path which is a path of concentration specifically oh. not a path of insight which leads towards awakening um okay. mahamudra in particular is use, useful that step-by-step -step path what zogchen is really useful for is once you have a taste of that opening or taste of that awakening zogchen is excellent at detailed instructions about how to stabilize that awakening from moment to moment how to remember oh. consistently over time zogchen teachings come from the enigma lineage which is like the ancient lineage the oldest lineage of the tibetan teachings so zogchen is very simple in certain ways in its articulations but it's not as good at the step-by-step -step unfolding so what uh, Dan's been able to do in his the way he's uh, learned these teachings is to synthesize both Mahamudra and Dzogchen in a really effective way. Um, some of the more advanced Dzogchen teachings that we've been learning lately come from the Bon tradition. So the Nyingma tradition is the, the tradition of Tibet. The Bumpo tradition is a tradition that comes actually from much further east, has different origins and a different civilization. And so the Dzogchen teachings we've been learning are really about stabilizing and completing the path. So if anybody wants the most basic breakdown, the way that I've learned it is that Mahamudra is good at step-by-step, -step, from ordinary awareness to your first taste of awakening, and Dzogchen is good at how do you stabilize that awakening and complete the path to full enlightenment. Yeah, whoa. Yeah, it makes sense to draw on both of them as well. Um, Dan, in yeah. a lot of ways, is one of these integralists where he's looking at the traditions and he's saying... Uh, from a practitioner's perspective, what does this path do more effective than this path, and how do you actually bring them all together? In Tibet, that was called a tradition called Rime, which means non-sectarian. Mm. There's a non-sectarian or a translineage perspective yeah. that's really useful. So the practice that, that I've learned from Dan and the practice that Dan's taught and the different lamas and teachers we bring in are all part of that uh, orientation, Rime, or non-sectarian. Yeah. Whoa. So we're moving now into an era, era of uh, global rime, or non-sectarian or translineage practice as a human species, not just within Tibetan culture, what practices work best for what aspects of the path, but as a human species, what aspects of different lineages work best for different aspects of our own unfolding. That's what uh, Adi Da called the great tradition of humankind. We're actually entering into an era where we actually can stand in one single human lineage. The great inheritance of wisdom is now here and available to us, no longer divided into these different mm -hmm. branches, but actually we have it all here, and we can in integrate that into a true translineage path. It's part of your, it seems like part of your interest and your totally. destiny. Mm.
Whoa. Whoa. Given our moments now where there's such abundance in the internet age and the computational renaissance that we can now take timeless spiritual wisdom lineages and we can see how for a un for every one of us is is a unique uh combination and uh also like you said translineage but also getting down to to water um that's why it's translineage. It means that you take one really, really deep, but you also can move beyond it. You have to stand in something with depth before you can move beyond it. You can't just sample, as we said earlier. Okay, interesting. So part. Oh, interesting. So part of the of the buffet is that one one bite um, isn't a really good representation. That if you 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 take the the full the full meal in which takes time to take the full meal in you can taste the buffet until you decide which meal is the best fit for your particular orientation then you have to eat the whole meal once you've eaten the whole meal you can then explore other flavors but you've eaten the whole meal your belly's already full you're not exploring to sort of see something that's missing you're you're already full in your own practice your path your realization yet you might supplement so that you can fill out different aspects of the realization or the practice that you might not have otherwise been able to fill out within your single meal, the flavors that weren't in your single meal. So you need both. Exactly. May I uh, also eat another meal yes, and go down that so I can maybe eat many meals? So your motivation yeah. might be different. Okay. So when you eat your first meal, it's because you're hungry and you need food and you need to fill up your belly with realization. If you eat a second meal, it's not because you're hungry, but you might eat the second meal out of a deep care because you want more tools to be able to help other beings. Yeah. So you might want to eat the second meal because the meal you ate might not be right for everybody. So you want to eat a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth meal so that when someone comes to you and they're hungry, you have the right flavor for them to fill their belly. So that would be the motivation to eat more than one meal. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. 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 Ah. Ooh. All right. A um, couple of the last um, questions that um, we like asking. Um, I want to hit this one on the way. You've had this process that you've done now um, with, uh, with Mikey Siegel where you guys host sessions where you um, listen to other people's heartbeats while mm. you look at them in the eyes. Yeah, M Mikey is such a pioneer. I hope he comes on the show. So um, Mikey, I, he hates it when I say this, but it's true. Mikey's going to be like written into the textbooks about the evolution of consciousness when it comes to how technology and consciousness interface. Mikey's designed something called the group flow process where we hook 24 people up to like a central brain and that central brain is all sort of coordinated by a consciousness jockey like a dj like a cj and that cj can actually play with the different ways in which different biometrics are playing out into the real time into the space we can play people's heartbeat through speakers we can play people's heartbeat through headphones we can swap heartbeats um, we sometimes use breath sensors to breathe together to harmonize breathing as collectives and to listen to each other's breath and it's all translated into sound into light so one of the things that we do, because you mentioned it, is that we have this amazing practice where we sit together, we listen to our own heartbeats, which in and of itself can be a profound experience. Just the, many of us never heard our own heartbeats. We realize, wow, it's such an intimate relationship with ourselves. And then what we do is we actually make eye contact with another person and we really ritualize the process of trading hearts. You take a light with your heart pulsing on it. You hand it to somebody else gently and delicately as you look at them in the eyes. And we have our CJ, our consciousness jockey, shift their heartbeat into your ears. So you're like holding a person's heart in your hands as it's glowing with light. You're looking at them in the eyes and you're hearing the heartbeat. 
talk about an incredible way to connect as human beings. So m one of Mikey's thesis is that if technology is currently being used to create massive division, separation, and isolation in human species, well, technology is neutral. So how can we use technology to actually bring us into deeper connection, into deeper awakening, into deeper intimacy with each other? Um, so anybody who's not familiar with Mikey Siegel's work or consciousness hacking, he's doing amazing work. I've had such a fun time teaching with him at, at retreats every year at SLN and, and elsewhere. So that's worth checking out if other people uh, aren't familiar with that. Ah. Consciousness hacking, co-hack. Dot com, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah. It's a great yeah, place yeah, to yeah. check out Mikey's yeah. work. And you can find um, our uh, playlist also with uh, Consciousness Hacking's Awakened Future Summit. We did partnership interviews with them. You guys can find that playlist on our channel um, where we talk to many of these leaders that are doing pioneering work. You say, you know, technology can be used. Um, in malevolent ways it can also be used in all these benevolent ways and for us to find the benevolent ways like this exercise um is, is gorgeous listening to your heart again get a 30 or 40 dollar telescope uh, stethoscope on uh on um any on amazon or any of the other platforms and just uh um, and listen to your own heartbeat and it'll and listen to your gut and it changes your life um and then if you can partake in one of those activities where you can you know, receive someone's light lit up hard and hear their heart beat. Like I love the design of, of experiences like that because it cat it's, it's an option on the buffet that is very new to the technology technology mm -hmm. age that, um, can, uh, enrich people to want to care more about the spiritual path mm. so like technology can be super uh conducive to uh, people desiring to get onto that spiritual path yeah yeah. One of the things that I found, I, I teach a class at Stanford that actually Mikey first started called uh, Technology and Meditation. And uh, we always do a uh, survey at the beginning of class, like who meditates. And obviously it's a self-selected group, but like 95% of the people have a meditation practice. And we ask like, who's meditating using an app? And again, it's like 80 to 90% of people are meditating because of an app. So technology can bring people onto the path. Yeah. But the coolest thing about that class is that we give them all this technology, they try it out. And at the end we say, who's gonna continue their meditation practice? Cause we also give them instruction in class. And you know, 100% of people say they're gonna continue. And we say, who's gonna continue with the apps? And by that point we've given them enough instruction, but they don't even need to use the apps anymore. So I see apps and technology as such a positive on-ramp to get people interested yes. and hooked yes. for things they might not have otherwise been uh, interested in. So I'm all for technology and apps uh, as long as they create an, an on-ramp for deeper practice. Yeah. And how do you see the way that we have uh, in the harmonic interconnectedness of uh, our natural environment, we see things like larger trees sequestering carbon in, a, in, a, in excess amounts and redistributing that through their roots and fungal networks to smaller trees and seedlings that don't get so much. Meanwhile, in our um, wealth inequality, we don't see similar inclusive stakeholding frameworks. So how do you see like spiritual evolution um, playing a part in the, uh, the redesign of the social contract for inclusive stakeholding to have um, oh, a deeper amount of love and compassion for the rest of us on the planet, not seeing as an other, but seeing as another, as a brother, sister, as another part of this human. Yeah. yeah. You know, for most of, of human history, not for most of human history, there's a, been a huge segment of people who are interested in inner work. And for a long time, let's just look at the United States from the 1960s. So there was a big group of people who were really interested in inner work and they sort of went on meditation retreats. They saw the Beatles studying with Maharishi Mahash Yogi and they said, oh, maybe if I go inward, I can find a way to transform my own mind. And a lot of those people did have a lot of success going inward and they actually discovered some things about their own mind and their own awareness. But often that group of people was not very impactful in the world. Also in the 1960s, there was this birth of people who uh, actually said, whoa, look at what's happening in the world. Like we have civil rights movement, women's movement, environmental movements beginning. And they said, we really need to have impact in the world. We need to actually look at the social inequalities and what's happening. We need to do something to actually make an impact and change. But often that group would see so many struggles and problems in front of them that they would end up finding they would get burnout. 
So what I see happening right now is this amazing opportunity for integration where the people who have spent time going inward have actually gained some source of inexhaustible energy. And on the external, the people who have actually doing the impact in the world have an opportunity to go inward. Yeah. And when these two come together, it seems like we have an opportunity for people to go into the world with extreme um, positive impact and a reservoir of inexhaustible energy for real change to happen. So I'm really hopeful. I think it's happening now. Um, my wife works for a foundation and and um, the interest that's sprouting around inner work and development is like going you know off the charts and same thing I'm, I'm working now with uh, Evolve Foundation which is an organization started by Bo Shao and uh, the, the inner work that people are, are interested in now is just it's amazing so I think that we're coming to a place in our own evolution at least in, in Western um, American culture and Western culture where we actually see these two streams that were born in the 1960s of inner work and outer transformation coming together into a, a single river and so i'm really hopeful i don't know exactly how it's going to unfold but i do know that 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 with that inner resource of of spiritual awakening and a transcendence and inclusion of the self so self-compassion but also a much broader source of social good can bind with like the tried and true methods of social change that have been born through 40 or 50 or now 60 years of, of social change and social entrepreneurship i think that we have the app opportunity to see the real impact that that we all want to see so i don't know how it'll play out but i certainly hope to be a part of it and to play a role in it and i'm hopeful that these streams can come together into a really huge uh, impactful river uh, in the coming years Does it feel like humanity is a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence? Um, what do you mean by bootloader? And then I'll answer your question. I like the question. What do you mean by bootloader? Are we a stepping stone? No, no way. I mean, my, my thing is, my, my experience is that um, there's something incredibly precious about human beings and there's something incredibly precious about life itself. And as we start to really take seriously the, the spiritual path itself, I think that what we start to find is that these fears of sort of some super intelligence taking over, or AI taking over, to me, they're uh, externalized anxieties. Like we're, we're actually worried about our own aspects of self so taking over in ways that we aren't able to control. And so what, what I think is that we start to actually see the sacredness of life in such a way that like no part of reality is ever um, instrumentalized or utilized in a way that has some sort of negative or malicious intent behind it. As I said earlier, like we can actually start to see that we're living in a sacred world and that the intention behind the world is actually to reveal itself to itself. And when that orientation is present, I don't think that we see ourselves through this perspective that you're saying. I could have totally not understood the question too. What do you think? I go I go between the 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 these um these a lot um. Yeah. So will you say the question again? It was such a yeah. Uh, is humanity a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence? Yeah, no way. <laughs> no way. Digital super intelligence doesn't have an interior. Like, you know, we have it, one of the basic understandings that I've learned through integral theory is like we have an exterior and an interior. And although no matter how much a, a super intelligence might be able to externally exhibit the behaviors of empathy and, and care and massive intelligence, there's no actually like in there there. And um, do I think we may have the capacity to actually to, to integrate our particular interior with a super intelligent, uh, you know, bio created uh, super intelligence embed consciousness yeah. in that a might be digital possible. super intelligence. I mean, we might learn how to project our consciousness outside of our bodies, as many you know, people can do now, and and live in different uh, subtle realms and states and dream states. We might be able to learn how to do that and inject it into a super consciousness. But we would be the interior that we're injecting. So I, th I see a much more harmonious future than somewhere yeah, you yeah. know we're being used or taken over for some sort of uh, you know super intelligence. Hmm. Not unless we integrate with it, which we may. Is source giving us free will so that it can dance with uncertainty and that we can be 
artists of the symphony that's mm -hmm. unfolding? I think this is a good question for the users and the viewers to contemplate for themselves. I don't want to give an answer to it. This question around free will and determinism is one that goes so deep. And there's probably ways in which it's that both sides are true. Uh, and it, I find just the inquiry itself to be extremely, extremely uh, uh, tentilating. You know? yeah. It's yeah. really a cool question, but I'm not going to go there on this yeah. one. I don't want to give yeah. an answer to that. Uh, another uh, interesting point along it is that the more uh, spiritually awake and woke um, mm -hmm. we are, that the less spiritually fragmented we are, and the more spiritually fragmented we are, it seems like the less free will we have because we can have other forces be at play. From the Tibetan point of view that I've learned, there's, uh, there's always intention. And that there's intention, and that intention of individual intention begins to just become more and more transparent to a universal intention. And that universal intention is to awaken itself to itself. And from that perspective, do we say that it's free will or determinism? I mean, I do come down on the side of like the universe is trying to reveal itself to itself every moment, like even this one. Yes. Everybody listening between you and I, it's trying to reveal itself, saying, hey, do you recognize that we're actually the exact same awareness looking at each other? Yeah. You know, so who knows? Yes. Yes. Is this, are we on the Tao? Are we on the path have we veered off and we need to come back on how do you view that yeah each individual uh, is finding the way more and more fully uh, onto the path um, but th it's not that they have veered off the path it's that they're recognizing more and more clearly that they've always been on the path so there's a difference between sort of you know in the early Christian tradition is there like, such a thing as off path then from the perspective of the individual who is actually living and forgetting, they feel like they're off path, yes. They feel like they're off path, yes. but they're actually on path towards becoming more on path. Yes, because that's the nature of reality is that it's actually okay. bringing us all onto a deeper realization that we're all on path already. Okay. There's something primordial about being on the path, okay. yes. And it certainly feels a lot of the time, you know, for many people that they're not on the path, you know? But I wanna offer something, and that's that in the early interpretations of, uh, the word sen in the Christian tradition, the early Greek, maybe you've had other guests say this to you, but the, the idea of sen was to miss the mark, right? It's like the, the, you, just, you were shooting an arrow and it, it was just a bit off, but that means you can redirect. Yeah. So I really like about this idea of like being on the path, it's just like, can you remember moment to moment? The moment you remember, you're right back on path, you haven't missed the mark, but you miss the mark every time you forget every time you forget that there actually is a goodness underlying all of reality that's bringing things forth for you. It's a much larger discussion, which maybe you've even had with Jordan Peterson and others about sort of the nature of evil and these kind of things. But I think there's a perspective we can take where it can be totally inclusive of both the relative nature of good and evil and simultaneously this perspective that everything is actually unfolding in a beautiful way of, of, of the great perfection or Chen. And then what do you feel is most beautiful? Um, I want to give like a personal answer and uh, a bit more of a philosophical answer. Philosophical is it's more dry than personal. Philosophical is I was so moved with the first time I read Plato's Symposium. Mm -hmm. And in the symposium, uh, Socrates gives this amazing articulation of what's sometimes been called the ladder of love. And he says, you know, I've been a paraphrase and, you know, butcher it a bit, but basically the idea is that um, we begin by appreciating beauty in like another human being. And we see that beauty in another human being, and maybe it's in their like naked form. And we're just in awe about beauty. And then what happens is that we see another form and we actually say, well, there's something beautiful about that too. So we begin to realize there must be some transcendent principle of beauty that exists both in this form and in this form. So there's something higher. And then we begin to say, well, it's not only bodies that are beautiful. There's something about like the way in which we can uh, come up with, you know, mathematical formations and philosophy and like, wow, that's beauty. That's beautiful too. And then it's not just that, but it's the ways that we can build philosophical systems that govern society. And, you know, that's beautiful too. And we just move along this ladder of beauty or this ladder of love or ladder of lust. 
after beauty until we finally reach this this culmination of coming face to face with beauty itself and in the realization of beauty itself it's like we begin to see that like reality itself is so unbelievably beautiful right. and that ladder of realization that ladder of love is one that's been so deeply close to my heart and just to bring it into the micro like the process of being a father yeah. and having children and watching my wife for like 60 hours just like give everything she had to like give life to another human being yeah i mean that's beautiful yeah that's really beautiful so the whole is beautiful and the smallest most minute particular experience is beautiful and we find beauty through and through Thank you, brother. Thank you for the, the time and the questions and your care. Thanks for coming on to the show mm -hmm. for sharing with us. Mm -hmm. It's been beautiful. Such a joy. Such True a pleasure. Joy. Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the conversation that we had today. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the subjects that Dustin covered in the show, about all things timeless spiritual wisdom. Have more conversations about that. Have more practices about that. Check out the links in the bio below. Again, Dustin's website, also his book links check those out also the CrediblemindCom CrediblemindCom mm -hmm. as well and support the artists the entrepreneurs the spiritual leaders in your communities around the world support them help them grow and support us simulation our links are below to our show paypal patreon cryptocurrency support us and go and architect that future social fabric for prosperity. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Meditation on the way out? That's okay. Yeah, okay, sure, sure, sure. Shorty, sure, short one? Sure, sure. Short, short meditation on the way All out right. as well. Great. So just take a moment to sit up straight no matter where you are. And take a deep breath in, filling your belly. Exhale out. And feel your hands. And you take your hands and place them against your thighs or your knees. And just begin to explore the boundaries between where your hands end and your thighs begin. Can you find the boundary or the edge between your hands and your thighs? And then bringing your attention now to your whole body. So feeling your whole body all at once from the inside out. So rather than jumping around from different parts of your body, like your head, your foot, your knee, just feeling your body as a whole. And then begin to feel the air against your skin and your clothing against your skin. Where does your body end and the air begin? Can you find the edges or the boundaries between your body and the air? Just allowing your body to glow down, right, left, forward, and back. Just the glowing body opening with feeling. No edges, no boundaries. And just rest in this open awareness.
totally present with everything as each moment unfolds. Just radiating with awareness. Maintain this feeling and just go about your day or your night. Thank you, brother. Love it. Yeah. Moment to moment. That. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.